the best of the week on Relevant Radio. Scientists have found concrete evidence that there's a vast ocean beneath the Earth's surface. The idea of an underwater world has driven plenty of science fiction. But now, one group of researchers says it's not too far from science fact. They discovered an area inside the Earth's surface that's believed to hold many times more water than the rest of the Earth's oceans combined. The Drew Mariani Show on Relevant Radio. Yeah, let's talk about it. That was Secrets of the Universe, the water underneath the Earth's surface. Can you believe it? Is it true? Uh, I do want to talk about this. Dr. John Bergsman has been with me many times in the past. We're going to get to him in a couple minutes here, a minute or two. And, and just to put this into perspective, I mean, over the centuries, countless cultures have had their their flood stories, their flood myths, if you will. Myth's not the right word. I don't like that. There's 200 flood myths from different civilizations. All of these stories, you know, they, they point to a massive flood event. And that phenomenon suggests maybe a collective memory of local disasters. I don't think so. I think maybe it was something a lot larger. So there's this growing body of geological and archaeological evidence that's now pointing to what could have been a catastrophic flood event. A guy named Robert Ballard, he did research on the Black Sea. He's the guy who discovered the Titanic. And he suggests that there was a, a flood in that region about 7,000 years ago, and that might have been the source for Noah, right? I, I, I want to zoom out even further. How are we to interpret Scripture? And is there any evidence of a global flood? So some of the more recent scientific claims, one of the most fascinating discoveries comes from deep within the Earth itself. In 2014, scientists uncovered a vast underground ocean. Yeah, you heard me right. A vast underground ocean. Geophysicist Steve Jacobson described it as a whole Earth water cycle. It's held in a mineral called ringwoodite, and it's about 400 miles below the Earth's surface. So just imagine a reservoir of water so massive that it could contain, they claim, three times more water than all the oceans combined. Could this underground water have been the source of the Great Flood? Some scientists are beginning to ask these questions. And it's fascinating to think. If you go back to Genesis 7, 11, it says, and this is an interesting quote, right? It says, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth. I remember watching a Noah film or documentary once, and they, the, the reenactment was just that. It's as if though the earth opened, and wells of water, fountains of water just burst forth. And that's what Genesis tells us. All the fountains of the great deep burst forth. That is the water from within the earth surged up during Noah's flood. And, and modern science seems to be catching up with this biblical description in ways that, you know, I, I never thought even possible. One more thing to consider, and we can talk about it, right? Recently, scientists also made a very chilling discovery about a mass extinction event 250 million years ago. It was called the Great Dying. And according to the reports, this catastrophic event, right, this catastrophic event, it wiped out, they say, 90% of life on Earth. 90% of life on Earth? Sounds like the Great Flood, right? And just a few survived. This wasn't caused by a tsunami, but a massive underwater volcanic activity, they said. Could this be a connection to the underground water sources that researchers are now discovering? Could these events be a prelude to understanding the mechanics behind the Great Flood? The Catholic Church always teaches us you know, to look at Scripture, both spiritually and historically. And it's, it's not just about ancient stories, but it's about seeing how God, how his hand is active in the world, even in those natural events around us. Pius XII, Pope Pius XII, in his encyclical uh, Humani Generis, he, he said that Catholics are free to investigate and research history and the truth behind biblical events. And the story of Noah, that's no different. Science is a tool. And when it's used correctly, it can help us better understand God's creation and the mysteries within it. So here's the question. Could the floodwaters have come from within the earth? I'm joined this afternoon by a longtime friend of the program, Dr. John Bergsma. Uh, Dr. Bergsma, it's good to have you back with us today. This new evidence, to me, is just absolutely fascinating. It is indeed, Drew. The uh, idea of so much water, uh, three times as much as in the oceans, being trapped down in the Earth's crust, I think most people had the idea that below the Earth's crust, it was just molten material down there, some kind of hellacious you know, reservoir of magma 
But to imagine that there's a mineral down there that's containing huge amounts of water, that's kind of mind-blowing. It raises all interesting questions like how did it get down there, what keeps it there, and as you say, yep. can it burst forth and affect the water cycle on the surface? The center of the earth and, and what's what's there, it's so deep. I mean, we really... We can only make, you know, uh, assessments that we really don't totally know. And I, I would find it fascinating if God, you know, in his divine plan somehow uh, really allowed the, the earth, the, the water to burst, you know, forth from the earth. You know, there's a lot of talk, though, of, of regional floods. Like, okay, maybe the area where Noah lived flooded. Because in the caves of North American Indians, there are flood accounts. Uh, in the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh, you know, there are flood right. accounts and every every civilization seems to have a, a reoccurring theme of a of a massive flood and a man who somehow in a raft or a boat survived this with his families so what do you make of of that common theme that seems to transcend the continents and the ages yeah it seems like a corporate memory of a worldwide flood because all of those flood accounts from different aboriginal cultures recall it being worldwide and, and the necessity of some kind of boat or some kind of craft. And, and if it was merely a regional phenomena, then, then they would have recalled maybe some hero running to high ground because that's what you do if it's just in a region, but you only need a boat if it's more widespread right. than that. Of course, you know, it's, it's a fascinating thing, Drew. I never do this uh, until maybe within the past five years. But all the continents on the Earth are covered with flood-deposited rock. Wow. And if you just go by the standard dating that's used, you know, the, the millions of years pattern of the standard geological column, then really there's been at least six worldwide floods, according to just mainstream geology, that have laid down what are called these six rock mega sequences that are found at all the continents. Now, those that, you know, scientists who work with a, a young Earth model argue that all six of those, you know, mega floods that laid down these mega sequences that we see at the Grand Canyon, for example, they, they merge that all into one and mm -hmm. identify that with the flood of Noah. There's a lot of... <laughs> A lot of stuff that needs to be worked out to make that to answer all the questions that yep. that raises. But I do find it fascinating that we're we're most of us in North America are standing on top of uh, a mile or two miles of flood deposited sediment below our feet. Much of it looking like it was done catastrophically in a short amount of time. It, that's absolutely fascinating. I was having a conversation a little bit earlier today with one of my uh, one of my colleagues here at the at the network, and he was telling me about how the Great Pyramids show water movement on them, erosion. And as you point out, in in North America, we see that as well. It makes me question sometimes the current narrative in terms of how old uh, civilization is, uh, and whether it predates what we think. There's a uh, a place, an ancient site in southern Turkey called uh, Gobekli Tepe. It's it's home to the world's oldest monumental structures, built around twelve thousand years ago. It was called you know the world's first temple. But but a recent discovery there is is raising a lot of questions. I think they found a, a calendar, the uh, an old solar calendar that may change you know how we date a civilization. What's the popular thought of how old? I guess civilization is and, and, and when the flood took place. And you think that perhaps just as Christ mentioned uh, Noah in the scriptures, that perhaps there could have been a civilization, maybe a little bit more advanced knowledge than, than we ever thought uh, that was destroyed because of its sin and, and its arrogance by God. And it was recorded in the scriptures. Your thoughts on that. I mean, I, I know that's pretty broad, but maybe unpack that if you could. Yeah, definitely. So, I don't know, Drew, there's a lot of really curious archaeological finds all over the world, uh, monoliths, you know, huge, huge stones that look like they've been crafted, right. not by natural weathering, but by some kind of human activity. I've seen several of these in different places on the planet that are too big to move by any technology that, that we have right. or that we would imagine our, our ancient forebearers had, and, and yet they seem to have been moved and, and handled. There are archaeologists out there who, who employ that as an argument that, 
you know, these are remains of ancient civilization that uh, predates some kind of catastrophe, you know, a flood mm -hmm. that otherwise wiped out a lot of uh, the remnants of them. So this, this is really intriguing, and I, I think it's worth being open-minded yeah. uh, towards these kinds of discoveries when you study the history of science and the development of our knowledge of history and the natural world. You find that yeah. certain patterns of thought hold sway during a certain generation, and anyone who thinks outside the box uh, is usually, uh, you know, put under some kind of pressure yeah. and discouraged from doing that. And unfortunately, that's delayed us from recognizing yeah. and discovering, you know, many truths about our history and about the planet. So yeah. uh, keep an open mind. Uh, you know, the so-called caveman may not have been a caveman. He might have been <laughs> a high-tech man. It's true. And, uh and we've we've just you know lost lost something or tried to regain it. So. I, I was watching something, I guess the other night or a couple of nights ago, and you talk about those monolithic stones, right? They're so they're twenty, thirty thousand tons, right? You can't. How did anybody move them in ancient time? And they're so precisely cut, and they're placed with such precision, you can't get a piece of paper through them. And it doesn't sound like a guy with you know a stick and uh, you know a, a piece of flint on the end of it, you know, doing that type of thing. It seems like he must have had some other technology. Maybe they weren't as advanced as us, but maybe they had a different understanding of mathematics or science. And who knows? Maybe they were somehow erased. There's another theory I think called the Younger Dryas. A theory where there was an event I don't know, 10, 11, 12,000 years ago, I'm not quite sure how many, it was at least 10,000 plus, where uh, you know there was this sudden release of massive amounts of fresh water into the North Atlantic from the melting ice sheets, and that influx of fresh water disrupted ocean currents and had uh, an incredible uh, impact on on the planet as as we know it. So, you know, I, I wonder what brought about the flood. Could it be subterranean water, as Scripture says? Could it be the Younger Dryas? Could it be something else? Could it have rained for 40 days and for 40 nights? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so the, you know, if, if the Earth's surface is completely flat, uh, water would cover the whole Earth. I think it's something like to a depth of a mile. So wow. the reason why the water doesn't cover the whole earth right now is because the upraising of our continents, which, which encompass about 30% of the planet. Right. I've seen some interesting scholarship done of this truth that argues that the amount of dry land that appears on our planet is actually perfectly chosen, that mm. if it was much more or much less, we would have uh, serious climate consequences from that that would make life on Earth extremely difficult, if not impossible. Wow. So there seems to be something like a you know a, a providential guidance in terms of just e even something as simple as how much dry land we have on the planet, and it seems to be fine tuned for life. But regardless of that, Drew, the reason why we have dry land at all is because of the upraising. So yes, the reality of a global flood is definitely a possibility. And like I said, there's evidence that it's happened multiple times in history. And one yeah, of yeah. those or multiple of those could be associated with the flood that's recorded uh, for us in the Bible, yeah. because we are, you know, it's, it's ironic that there aren't these sedimentary layers for the most part out on the seafloor because yeah. the seafloor is much younger. But here on the continents that are dry, we have all this evidence of flood deposited, marine deposited, which is another way of yeah. saying by the sea or by the ocean, yeah. deposited animals and fish skeletons, et cetera, the, the remains, the fossils of marine dwelling creatures covering the entire continent. Oftentimes in rock layers that are tens, even hundreds of feet thick over thousands of square miles, you have to ask yourself, you know, what uh, what laid down a homogeneous layer of, for example, red sandstone that you see out in Arizona right. over hundreds of square miles, thousands of square miles in some cases, all relatively quickly, apparently, yeah. uh, with uh, you know animals caught in those layers? Um, I think we need to start thinking more catastrophically in uh, in terms of our understanding of uh, Earth processes. Hey, Doctor, thank you for your time. I am so grateful to have you. It's Dr. John Bergsma. If you missed any of the conversation, download our podcast and check out Dr. Bergsma at johnbergsma.com. Hey, like what you just heard? Then share it with your family and friends. And thanks for listening.